is a doctor in Canadian history from the University of Maine at Orono, two bachelors of arts degrees, couldn't quite decide, <laughs> and I know what you mean. adjunct faculty member at Bunker Hill uh, Community College in Charleston, Massachusetts, uh, also a member of the New England uh, Historical Genealogical Society, the uh, majority of his ancestors, at least on one side, were, were from, the, from Lunenburg County, and uh, he holds connections also to Prince of Rhode Island, I believe. Yes. So we would have uh, deep roots in those Lunenburg counties. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you, everybody. Can everybody hear me with this? Okay. Because um, <clears throat> I never had to hold the, the microphone before while speaking, so this is going to be interesting. Um, yes, so tonight we're going to talk about a murder that happened over 220 years ago. A murder with three, with three people that were murdered, and we're going to find out a little bit about what was going on in that murder. So, <clears throat> the title of the talk, Invisible Murders, The Trial for the Murders of the Emino Family of Township of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, in 1791. In late March 1791, the residents of the township of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, were shocked to learn of the murder of Frederick Emino, his wife Juliana Elizabetha Emino, and their granddaughter Catherine Elizabeth Emino. Frederick and Elizabeth Emino, with the granddaughter, had been murdered by their godson. George Frederick Boudelaire and his brother John James Boudelaire. From the time of the Mi'kmaq raids on Lunenburg Township in the late 1750s, during the Seven Years' War until 1791, there had been no murders in the community. What is remarkable, <coughs> what is remarkable about the murders is the trial itself. The murders, the murderers were tried for the death of Frederick Emino only. The murdered women are largely absent from the trial proceedings and are essentially invisible in death as they had been legally invisible in life. <coughs> so, the Eminos. Frederick Emino immigrated to Nova Scotia in 1752 from Betancourt in the Lutheran Principality of Montbelliard as part of the migration of, um, from the Protestant areas of Europe, of the Holy Roman Empire, to Nova Scotia during the period 1749-52. He married the widow Juliana Elizabeth Frank and Feindell at Lunenburg in 1756. She was from the Principality of Falz Zweibrücken. They had three children, of which two sons lived to adulthood. They lived on a 30-acre farm lot at First Peninsula, which you can see here on the map, just above the town of Lunenburg. The Aminos became a prosperous family in the decades after the settling of the community. The Boudelaire brothers, they were born somewhere up the Northwest Range on a 30-acre farm lot, um, about three kilometers out from the town, so probably closer to Mahone Bay than to Lunenburg town. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> as young adults, these two Boudelaire brothers had moved away to Tadamagush on the north shore of Nova Scotia, which you can see on the map um, of central Nova Scotia. And <clears throat> they were sons of Jean of Jean Georges Boudelaire of Entebon, Montbelliard, and his wife Anna Catherine Maillard from Chenevier, Montbelliard. That couple had married in Halifax in 1752 and had 13 children in the Lunenburg Township, all of whom survived to adulthood. Imagine that, 13 children. <clears throat> so the Boudelaire brothers, they returned to Lunenburg from Tadamagush on the 15th of March, 1791, supposedly to visit their widowed mother. 
They spent their first evening at the home of Frederick and Elizabeth of Emina on First Peninsula before proceeding the next day to their mother's home on the Northwest Range on the 16th of March. The Boudelier brothers remained at their mother's home until the afternoon on the 18th of March, 1791, when they returned to the Emino home for another visit. They had supper with the Emino family and decided to stay the night. After it had been determined that the Boudelier brothers would stay the night, they followed Frederick Emino out to the barn to retrieve hay for making a bed. Once outside, according to the trial transcript, the Boudelier brothers feloniously, willfully, and of malice aforethought thought did assault, or did make assault, and that they, with certain large sticks of no value, which they severally in their hands, then in their held, him, the said Frederick Emino, in and upon the head, breast, back, belly, sides, and other parts of the body of him, the said Emino, then and there, feloniously, willfully, and of their malice, aforethought, diverse times did strike, beat, giving to him the said Frederick Emino, then and, then and there, by striking and beating him with sticks aforesaid, several mortal strokes, wounds and bruises, in and upon the head, breast, back, belly, sides, and other parts of the body of him, the said Frederick Emino, of which mortal strokes, wounds, and bruises, he then there and instantly died. <coughs> okay. The transcript further states that George and Frederick Poudelaire <coughs> did willfully make an assault upon the said Frederick Emino with a certain instrument of wood and iron commonly called a tomahawk, which he, the said George Frederick Boudelier in his right hand then and there held, and him the said Frederick Emino in and upon the head did strike and cut, giving him with the tomahawk aforesaid in and upon the head of him the said Frederick Emino one mortal wound, of which mortal wound the said Frederick Emino then and there instantly died. <clears throat> so, okay, that's a mouthful. So after killing Frederick Emino, the Boudelaires returned to the house where they, had killed, where they then proceeded to kill Elizabeth Emino and the granddaughter Catherine Elizabeth Emino. <coughs> the Boudelaires then apparently dragged the body of Frederick Emino into the house and set the house afire to destroy any evidence of the murder. The murderers then left the Emino home and made their way to Indian Point <coughs> to meet their brother David Boudelaire, who would be transporting them the next day to St. Margaret's Bay as they were returning to Tantamagouche. David Boudelaire was completely unaware of the crime that had been committed by his brothers earlier that evening. <coughs> At a distance, or a distance from the Emino home, as they made their way to Indian Point, the Boudelaires were noticed or seen to have been crossing the ice between First and Second Peninsula, a narrow peninsula between, uh, a narrow body of water between these two peninsulas. Um, but their behavior at the time arose no suspicion. It wasn't uncommon to see people crossing the ice. Opposite the Emino home on First Peninsula were the farms of Joseph Contois and Nicholas Eisenhower on Second <coughs> Peninsula. <coughs> The two peninsulas, like I said, being separated by a narrow three kilometer long inlet. The first to see the Emino House of Lays at about 4 a.m. was Nicholas Eisenhower, who sent word to his neighbor Joseph Contois. They crossed the ice on the inlet to reach the Emino home. However, they were too late because the house had been entirely burnt except for the chimney and some of the major beams of the house. <coughs> They found the charred remains of Frederick Emino, as described by Joseph Contois in his summarized testimony. It appeared to be the remains of old Emino. The limbs were all burnt off and the inside burnt out. The remaining trunk lay with the back to the beam, part of the skin remaining, burnt and shriveled up like parchment. Where the back had touched, the clothes remained unconsumed, and he appeared to have had on his jacket a woolen garment that he wore <clears throat> for the rheumatism, 
and below that his shirt with a handkerchief around his neck. Upon examining, they found blood under his clothes, between the shoulders, dried as if it were burnt by the fire. <clears throat> this was about the middle of the room within which they had, which had been the house. As did his wife and granddaughter who lived with him, there were no remains to be found, but here and there a bone entirely consumed. So the testimony of John Con or Joseph Contois is one of the few places in the trial transcript that the two women have even mentioned. <clears throat> it can be presumed that Contois and Nicholas Eisenhower had mentioned the MO woman by name during the trial, but the transcript doesn't mention their names. The transcript is not a verbatim <clears throat> transcript in regard to the testimony of the witnesses. It is fairly extensive, but never once are the women mentioned by name. It's assumed that it's kind of a summarized transcript. <clears throat> the indictment at the beginning of the trial is very clear that the Baudelaire's are on trial for the murder of Frederick Emino. The indictment goes into great speculative detail about how Frederick Emino was murdered, like we've already heard, but there is no indictment for the murder of the two women. They are essentially invisible in death as they had, were legally in life under English common law. Joseph Contois, in his summarized testimony, refers to the two women. His testimony states that there were no clear remains to be found of the women other than a few small pieces of bone. The fire had essentially consumed the bodies of the two women. It may be the lack of physical <laughs> evidence that prevented an indictment for their murders. It is clear that after the 19th of March, 1791, neither of the MO women were ever seen again and that they are considered to have been murdered. Nicholas Eisenhower was the only other witness to testify regarding the discovery of the burned house and the charred remains of Frederick Emino's body. His testimony was summarized as such. <clears throat> they, meaning Contois and Eisenhower, quenched the fire and they raked the trunk out with a claw hook and upon it and put it on a piece of board. It had on the remains of a shirt, a red baize garment, a linsey woolsey waistcoat, and upon the shirt was blood, having a baked look. So whether or not Nicholas Eisenhower referred to the Emino women in his testimony, it is not known because the summary of his testimony is much shorter than Joseph Contois. So the lawyer for the Crown and the author of the published transcript was James Stewart. The transcript was published in 1791. In his introduction to the transcript of the trial, he acknowledges that a family member had been murdered. Quote, when we reflect upon the deliberation of malice with which the deed had been meditated, planned, and perpetrated, when we consider that it had been the determination of some month's standing and that a week's journey at an inclement season of the year, in fact, the murder was yesterday in 1791. Um, that through the most des desert parts of the country had been undertaken for the express purpose of executing an abominable scheme. And when we view the obstinate malignity of the perpetrators whose flinty hearts neither the kind reception nor cordial friendship with the deceased and his family could soften or shape from the diabolical purpose with the economical circumstances of their guilt, we pause with amazement at the while acknowledging the murder of a family, Stuart does not mention them by name or how many people were killed. They are ghosts. <clears throat> so about seven weeks after the murder, the trial began in the early afternoon of the 3rd of May, 1791, in Lunenburg Town, when the indictment was read to the grand jury that was composed of 20 male residents of the county of Lunenburg. During the indictment phase of the trial, the Chief Justice of, the, of Nova Scotia, the Honorable Thomas Andrew Strange, explained to the grand jury that the purpose of convening the jury to determine if a trial was warranted given that a murder had occurred. So the, jury, so the grand jury had to determine
determine whether a trial was necessary. His instruction, <coughs> excuse me, his instruction acknowledged the, the murder of a family when he stated, I scarcely inform you that its main object is to inquire concerning the blood of an unfortunate family, late no more in this part of the province, supposed to have come to their death by murder. This is the only legal mention of the MNO women during the grand jury phase of the trial. It does not specifically refer to two women. It merely states that an unfortunate family was victim to murder. <clears throat> the trial continued later that afternoon. The grand jury returned a verdict that the brothers, George Frederick and John Boutelier, had murdered Frederick Emino, and that there was cause to have a trial. The charges were later stated, as I had read earlier in the paper, the women were not mentioned at all. The trial itself started the next day, on Wednesday the 4th of May, a jury of 12 men from Lunenburg County heard the trial. They were tasked with determining upon the available evidence <clears throat> if the Boudelier brothers had committed murder of the late Frederick Emino. They were not given any instructions regarding the deaths of the Emino women, who were not again mentioned. The trial opened up with the clerk of court reading the indictment which had been previously read to the grand jury. Again, that formulaic language. <clears throat> After the clerk read the indictment, the Crown Solicitor James Stewart opened the trial, stating the charges that George Frederick M. Boudelier and John Boudelier stood indicted by the grand inquest of the County of Lunenburg for the murder of Frederick Emino on the 19th of March last. Following the charges having been read, Stewart outlined the case against the Boudelier brothers in great detail, which was followed by the witness testimony starting with John Contois, I mean Joseph Contois and Nicholas Eisenhower. The other witnesses were people who detailed when and where they saw the Boudelier brothers, either before or after the murders occurred. After the last witness, <clears throat> the trial returned, the trial turned to the testimony of George Frederick Boudelier and John Boudelier upon their arrest in March of 1791, several kilometers north of Halifax on their way back to Tanlagouche. <clears throat> their examination and questioning was done in Halifax. The Boudelier brothers completely denied having visited the Eminos on their visit home, despite the evidence and the, um, the testimony to the contrary from their siblings. Their own siblings said, oh yeah, they visited the on the Eminos. Uh, the Boudelier brothers, they declined to testify at the trial. They declined to call witnesses. <clears throat> so the Chief Justice of the province, uh, Thomas Strange, who presided over the trial, summarized the case, gave instructions to the jury for their deliberations. Throughout the entire trial, the only recorded mention of Elizabeth Emino and Catherine Elizabeth Emino was in the testimony of Contois, and because the transcript is not a verbatim record of what was said, it is not known if Contois or Nicholas Eisenhower actually used their names. <clears throat> the jury deliberated for an hour and a half, came back with a guilty verdict. The next day, on the 6th of, of May, which was a Thursday, the trial resumed for the sentencing phase. The Boudelier brothers were sentenced to death. In his sentencing, Chief Justice Strange referred to the women when he states that the Boudelier brothers came into the, count, into the country with the express and no other intent than to perpetrate the horrid act for which you have been convicted. <coughs> there is reason to believe, as well as from the manner in which you lurked while you remained in it, as from the circumstances of your having gone out of your way to stop at old Emino's house on the Tuesday evening instead of proceeding straight to your mother's, and that it was on your, pur on your purpose to have perpetrated it that very night, that time had been right is highly probable. But be it that as may, that you did upon the Friday following, choosing your particular day for reasons known only to yourselves, by secret and untold untrod paths, find your way back to this peaceful and defenseless habitation 
and then and dip them in there, destroy this helpless family that had, according to your own declarations, received you with a kindness which they could not afford at all. No person living that has heard your trial, the verdict, can be supposed to have remaining any remaining doubt. <clears throat> So having destroyed this helpless family, Strange further states that neither gray hairs nor tender youth nor sex is spared. He continued, a whole family, doubtless first bathed in blood before they were with the house that covered them reduced to ashes. The Chief Justice refers to the family again when he stated, the finger of providence has so pointed you out that all who see you See now to their perfect conviction that the hand that destroyed the wretched Emino and his unfortunate wife and grandchild. <clears throat> In his comments before sentencing, Chief Justice Strange acknowledges the death of the two women, but again, they are never mentioned by name. Throughout the trial, their names are never mentioned, nor is anyone formally charged with their murders. The sentencing phase of the trial concludes with the final sentence. The Boudelier brothers are to be hanged. Chief Justice Strange reads out their sentence. Thank you, George, thank you, uh, thank you. Yeah. That you, George Frederick Boudelier, and you, John Boudelier, and each of you be conveyed back to the place from whence you came, and from thence to the place where you stood the house, where stood the house of the late Frederick Emino, or as near to it as conveniently may be. And when you come there, you must, each of you, be hanged by the neck till you are dead. <laughs> so three days after the trial ended, my five times great grand uncles, George Frederick and John Boodley, were hanged by the neck until they were dead at the site where they committed the murder. The trial was the murder about uh, the murders of three people, my three times great grandparents and their 14-year-old granddaughter. <clears throat> Since a man was among the three people murdered, only the death of Frederick Emino was covered by the trial. <clears throat> the legal position of Elizabeth Emino and Catherine Elizabeth Emino was obscure at best. <clears throat> they were dependents with, without legal identity. When the Chief Justice recognized their deaths in the sentencing phase, the Boudelaire brothers were found guilty for one murder. The women were possibly seen, possibly seen, as legal extensions of Frederick Emino. The situation and its circumstances left very little physical evidence of the female murder victims as the fire consumed pretty much the entire house. Only the burnt out torso of Frederick Emino <coughs> was found. The bodies of Elizabeth Emino and the granddaughter Catherine Elizabeth were entirely consumed by the fire, leaving no evidence. The lack of evidence, meaning their bodies, may have been a larger part of the reason that they were not fully acknowledged in the trial. As women, they were legally non-persons. <clears throat> it was not until 1929 that women in Canada were recognized as having legal personhood by the Judicial Committee of the Imperial Privy Council in London in the Edwards versus Canada case. So the Privy Council in 1929 ruled that women were persons under the law, overturning a Canadian Supreme Court ruling. So it's entirely possible that given the legal positions at the time, that these women, they did not need to have a trial for them because they were already being put on trial for the death of Mr. Emino, and that because there was no physical evidence for them, you couldn't, they couldn't legally put them on trial for their deaths because there was no evidence that they were dead. So, thank you. Are there questions for the speaker? Oh, yes, we have questions. And with this, it is not mentioned, what was the motive? Ah, uh, the motive. <coughs> um, they were not really sure. Um, it's been speculated that the motive was money. That they thought that, um, because when you read the whole transcript of the trial, the Emino brother, I mean the Boudelaire brothers thought that um, the Eminos had money. 
and there was really no money to be found in the house. The Emino's were like, they, they were most, like most families in Lunenburg, they were just getting by. <clears throat> you know, they were successful farmers, but cash was in short supply, and they didn't really have any money. They took a few things from the house. Um, one of the interesting things that helped bag them, or, you know, catch them out, but it wasn't actually presented at the trial, um, Frederick Emino had a piece of chalk in his pocket. His son, Frederick Emino Jr., had the other piece of chalk. And when the Rudelaire brothers were captured on their way back to town of Agouche, the piece of chalk that was found in um, one of the Rudelaire pockets matched up with the piece of chalk that Frederick Jr. had. But that piece of evidence came to Lunenburg after the trial had concluded. Uh, so most of the trial was based on circumstantial evidence where people have seen them. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. In your preliminary remarks, you, uh, you mentioned that the previous murder for that had been, uh, I believe you're referring to the Pazant raid. That was one of them. Yeah. Which you said was perpetrated by Mi'kmaq, but I understood that was by <coughs> members of the tribe up near Quebec, not Mi'kmaq. Well, there were quite a few, I mean, the Pazant thing was, was done by that, but there were also other murders at, the, at that time period during the Seven Years' War. Um, there were murders um, out there. Um, the Ox family was slaughtered out on the Northwest Range. We don't know if it was Malice or Mi'kmaq. Um, you know, some people have presumed it was Mi'kmaq. I mean, I could just, um, it could have just as easily been the Malice. You know, then there were a handful of others. That, there were probably about a dozen people murdered in Lunenburg Township during the Seven Years' War. So the Paysan one is the one that gets all the attention because that one has been written about uh, quite a bit. Uh, you say that uh, uh, women were invisible. <coughs> That's why I think in this case, because there was no physical evidence of the two women. Yeah. Um, so women in that so had the bodies been found, then they probably would have been put on trial yeah. for all three. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I've kind of tried to parse it that way, that that because there were no there was no physical evidence. But that they, doesn't have to do with women being invisible. Right, but they're invisible in the trial. Their names aren't even mentioned. That's what I'm getting at with the term invisible. Maybe I'm not, didn't, you know, um, make that clear enough. That may be more a function of a legal profession in Lunenburg County in 1791. And picking up on this gentleman's point, uh, Henry said that um, at law, uh, we did have women, at this, according to the Nova Scotia Historical Society paper 10 years ago, maybe, voting. Because they had to vote in Nova Scotia That was remarkable uh, for a couple of reasons. I think the jury, uh, to be on a jury, you didn't have to be a retailer at that time. You had to own property. So some woman fell into property and got on uh, juries, and uh, I'm thinking, but they also got on the polls, uh, sheriff's polls in counties, and they voted. Now, women also could be accused of law, uh, and about uh, that time, we had the uh, piracy trial of Ned Jordan, who uh, was convicted of murdering the uh, brother of Tremaine, I think, the guy who ran the rope works on English Street, was owed a debt by this uh, couple uh, up in the Bay of Shalur. His brother went up to collect it, and the husband and wife took the brother out of the boat and then murdered him. They were both charged. Okay. So I'm just saying that. Yeah, I mean, I'm hanging on to his yeah. line. I mean, I'm not a lawyer either. That woman so. could be yeah. accountable before the law, and they could vote. Um, they didn't have an ideal time of it, but, and also in terms of inheritance, you had uh, men inheriting, uh, surely, on behalf of uh, 
the woman, but they were held as trustee for that, the money they held. Right, yeah, the battle so laws. And, they they were, were, and, and the, yeah. We didn't have um, a Women Property Act back then, but we had some equity balance in inheritance. In, in 1758, uh, to get the women's voting, uh, when, when Nova Scotia voted for the first legislature, we actually know who voted in Lindenburg. We have the names of the voters and who they voted for. There were no women. Um, so, in, at least in the 1750s, I mean, because you said women before 1753. Well, there's a, the article I was referring to was by our own, in our own journal, and it had uh, women voting before 17, around 1793 up until 1853 on polls, sheriff's polls in various counties where women held land. And then you can just respond because I think this is a really interesting case of um, women in law in this period, and I'm more familiar with the French than the English, but generally the femme couverte, or a woman is covered by um, her association with an adult male. So uh, especially a 14-year-old girl is covered by her guardian, and a married woman is covered by her husband. So you'll have cases where women are acting as people when they're not covered when they're widows or when they're adults and then married. But I'm just wondering, is this like an extreme case of being covered, covered where the two women's trial would have been so much more difficult? And they thought, well, we got them on the guy, so that'll, that'll handle it. They'll be dead and, you know, that, so if they, it was just seen as sufficient because for, that's just a thought that I had on that. that no, we, I, I thought that, that too. Way. I mean, I think that's a valid thought that they figured, okay, we got, them, we got them on him, so we referenced the women indirectly, we've acknowledged that three people were killed, but we only have the evidence of one, so we're gonna get them on one, and you know, you can't put them to death three times. <clears throat> so, yeah, so, and the whole idea of femme Colbert, I mean, because that also exists in English common law, too, in colonial New England, so I can't imagine it wasn't that much different than here in colonial Nova Scotia things at that time period. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm unclear in the relationships here. Are the Boudelers then, they're all related to you, are the Boudelers then cousins of the Eminos? Uh, at that point, no. Okay. Um, the Boudelers, um, that, uh, early on in, in the Bloomberg, the families weren't all intermarried yet. Um, it's just that as I trace my own ancestry back is where I'm like, oh, okay, my mother yeah. has Baudelaire ancestry, my mother has Emino ancestry, my father has Baudelaire ancestry, yeah. so. <coughs> kind of hard yeah, I mean, if everybody in Lunenburg is related to themselves, I mean, because we're all multiply descended, I mean, um, um, so, yeah. I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. I mean, this was the first murder to occur in the county, um, and I think it was, a, you know, it was seen as a spectacular event because the chief justice came down to try to murder. Um, but whether that type of justice was common, um, I don't know. But I, I do think it's interesting that the site of the execution was the site where they. It's like almost like a. The, the ultimate step in justice, you know. Just a question, where are, where are the Eminos buried and the Woodlers buried? There's a little cemetery under the peninsula, which I'm quite familiar with, and I was wondering if they got to that cemetery. Um, well, there was nothing of the Eminos to bury. I mean, the two women were completely consumed. Um, I, if the, I have no idea where the Eminos are buried. Um, two years ago, I gave the same paper down, the same talk in Lunenburg, and an Emino, their Eminos still live on that property. And they didn't say anything. They didn't come forward and say, oh, we know where Frederick Eminos told, you know, what's left of his body is buried. Um, there's very few gravestones from the 
1700s. So um, it's probable that you know that their great that they if they had a wooden grave stone from Frederick Emmanuel's torso, that it would have long since rotted away. Um, so yeah, so nobody seems to know where the Emin you know where he's buried, and I, I don't know where the um, Brule Rose are buried. I've not seen any reference anywhere. Um, again, because 1790s, who's going to spend the money to put up a, a gravestone for two twenty-somethings that murdered three people? You know, when when money was short and dear. Yeah, but I don't see any indication that they have a lawyer at all. Um, and, you know, there's nothing in the trial that seems to indicate that they, they had their own lawyer. So at that time, the judge did not appoint a lawyer. Did. Right. Okay. And from and from what the transcript says, most of their testimony was given in Halifax when they were arrested. So if that was written down and recorded anywhere, that hasn't survived. Or, or if it did, James uh, Stewart, the, the, the one lawyer, didn't access that. So we only have the, the, the written transcript that was from Lunenburg. John has it. How, how do you think the relationship between the Emmanuel's and the Lewis evolved to the next generation of who were the remaining grand rulers, such as supervisors? <coughs> So I don't see any evidence of that. I mean, a lot of the Boudelet families in the 1790s, they were moving away. Um, and you, you see the biggest um, group of Boudelais moving to St. Margaret's Bay. Um, so the Boudelet family seems much more common in that part of Nova Scotia than they are in Lunenburg County. I mean, yeah, in, in, in the main part of Lunenburg Township. Um, whether or not there was any lingering bad blood between the two families, I don't know. I mean, Frederick Boudelaire had three children. Um, one child was definitely his. The first child may have been from his wife's first marriage, prior marriage, because she was already pregnant, and there's the question of who the father was. But yeah, so there's no, there's no, um, no record that I know of, of, of there being like a happy or McCoy type. <clears throat> I'll just make a remark that uh, Thomas Edward Strange, if you go over to Oxford University, Christchurch Dining Hall, where part of uh, one of the early Harry Potter movies was filmed, you'll find a lovely uh, full length portrait of him in his beautiful red robes. Oh, you don't have to go that far to see him. You just get down to the law courts down here on the waterfront and just ask the Missionaire to let you in and see the portrait of him there. So, and it's it's a, it must be, it must be a copy of the one at Oxford because it, I've seen pictures of the two and they look very similar. Um, yeah. Anything in your research that indicates why the Boudlers moved from New York? <coughs> um, you mean the two brothers? Yeah. Well, or the remaining. The the rest of the family said they migrated and they left Lunenburg County and came to St. Margaret's Bay. A, in the 1780s, I think it was Governor Park, if I'm remembering correctly, he was encouraging people to settle in that area um, in part to help augment the fisheries. And quite a number of, of, of Lunenburg families, uh, Boudelaires, Dauphinais, Dories, uh, moved to that, re that area and a few other families. Um, just like in the 1770s, um, when Frederick de Bar got his estate, or whatever you want to call it, up on the North Shore, he somehow encouraged, because he had a Montbelliard connection, he somehow encouraged all these Montbelliard settlers from Lunenburg to move to his estate as tenant farmers. It's like, well, why would you give up your free land in Lunenburg to become a tenant farmer, which is what you've been in Europe? And so, <clears throat> yeah, and that's around 1771 that they have discussed it, though, that they left uh, for the Debar estate in, in kind of a gush. So 
Some of it was economic. In the case of St. Margaret's Bay, the governor wanted to develop that area and encouraging Lunenburg's growing population to spread its wings, so to speak. So, does that answer your question? That's good enough. Okay. Based on your reading of the whole transcript and considering the whole situation, um, do you think Brown had a good case? Do you think it was a fair trial? By today's standards, it was not a fair trial because they didn't have representation. Um, but by the standards of, of that time period, well, I, I don't know how to judge whether it was fair or not. Um, they didn't have a lawyer. Um, the evidence was circumstantial, um, but it seemed overwhelmingly circumstantial enough that it convinced the jury to convict them. Um, and um, what was the other kind of question? Oh, so, uh, it doesn't seem like a good case. Yeah, um, today it probably would have been because there were bone fragments found, but they didn't know whose bones they were necessarily. They were, you know, today forensic science would have been able to do that much in terms of convicting them, um, at least determining that three people had been murdered. And I don't know in terms if DNA evidence would have been able to convict the brothers, you know, in terms of their being there because the fire consumed so much of the property. Um, but by yeah, today's standards, I don't think it would be considered a fair trial at all. stuff to keep up here sometimes, you know. But yeah, thank you, yes, Ms. Lombard was their lawyer. But you don't see much of him in the trial. Well, back in that period, they weren't allowed to address the jury. They could only sort of cross-examine the crowd and so they had a whole whole right. that they were allowed to finish. Can you talk about their confessions? Um, they did confess, um, but they confessed after they'd been convicted. Um, they confessed to Reverend Money. Um, which was the Anglican missionary, and then you know they broke down crying that they that they did do that they had con uh, done the murders. Um, so they did confess to it, but some people think that that's a false that was a false confession. Fifteen years ago, uh, when Lunenburg had its 250th anniversary, and they had this grand family reunion thing, and people were Know, presenting all their family tree research. I was there doing my stuff, and I had my early <clears throat> beginning work on this, and I so I had the complete transcript. Um, and some old elderly man comes in, they were framed, they were framed. <laughs> and he tried to say, and he tried to steal one of the copies that I had. And it's like, it's like 200 years ago. <laughs> they were framed. <laughs> That's exactly what they were. Was there any uh, evidence of privateers uh, money involved? Because about this time, a fellow named Enos Collins was a privateer down in Liverpool, made money out of Halifax and all along the South Shore. And uh, there's a marvelous uh, novel, Privateer's Fortune, and I just uh, wondered uh, if uh, he had lumber, was that contemporary? Well, Bridgewater didn't exist yet. Um, Bridgewater kind of evolves over the 1800s. Um, in terms of privateering in Lunenburg, I'm not aware of any Lunenburg people being involved in privateering. Um, the one person who might be able to answer that question is Dan Conlon, um, who was with Parks Canada now down at Pier 21, because he's done a lot of work on privateers out of, Loon out of Liverpool. But I'm not aware of Lunenburg. Just in respect to the question about where were the remains, we have a viewer online that says the story in Lunenburg is that the Bootler brothers were buried on their family property, roughly where the pet cemetery is now in the northwest. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, the pet cemetery. <laughs> that's okay. One, one of the questions, the or sorry, one of the things that you had mentioned at the beginning was that they had allegedly done this with Tomahawk. Where did they get the tomahawk? That that's never been that's never been determined. 
I mean, if you notice all formulaic language, they really don't know how they were murdered. Yeah. They do know that they had moccasins, because some of the people talk about seeing moccasin footprints to and from, and people had seen them wearing moccasins. So, um, because a couple other residents of the community were questioned because they owned uh, moccasins, um, but because the Boudelaires were known to have been at the Emino House, um, the, and, and the footprints to and in the snow to and from the house were moccasin footprints rather than regular shoes, um, that was one of the pieces of some, some, um, circumstantial evidence. But in terms of how they actually were killed, it's all speculative. I mean, was he beaten to death? Was he, yeah, was he hit in the head by the tomahawk, like it said in one, one part of the indictment, or was he beaten everywhere by sticks of no particular value, whatever? <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's all speculative because no one witnessed it. So my question was uh, exactly about that. So they only found his burned corpse, but at the beginning you, you brought a very detailed account of how he was possibly killed. So my question would have been, when did they get that information? Was that part of the confession of the Boudelier brothers, or was that just wild speculation? Yes, um, because the Boudelier brothers only confessed to the murder after they'd been convicted and sentenced. But they didn't, they didn't give all these details how they did, right. as you put on screen. Right, because that's what the indictment says. So I think the how they were murdered part, like I said, was formulaic language, trying to fill in the blank on how they were murdered. As a, you know, so, and because it, it contradicts it, because one place it's saying with sticks and, and whatnot, and then another place it says a tomahawk blow to the head. So, which, which was it, we don't know. And it's also difficult to prove that when, when the body is almost burnt. Exactly. I mean, if the, if the skull is all gone and all burnt, there's no way to prove that he was struck in the head. To, to follow up on that, I, what I find interesting, um, I, I have your book, it's great, by the way. Thank oh. you for doing all of that research. Um, what I find interesting is they supposedly drug Frederick back into the house Burnt the house. Right. I find it interesting that his torso was still there while the remains of the two women were completely either gone or consumed. I, I just find that a little contradictory. It, it may be because, I mean, we don't know where, what position, because it doesn't say where in the house. Was he, he was up against the beam. His body was, I would assume, the way they described it, um, he must have been in a seated position back against the uh, heavy beam, whereas the women might have just been on the floor, <coughs> dead. And so, yeah, I, it, it, it is kind of strange how, how that is. And they just say just various fragments of bone, mm -hmm. which of course, you know. Well, and then that leads to the question of how would various fragments of bone be true about the house? Yeah. Right? Because it does, they don't say where they found yeah. the bones, yeah. So it, it, it makes it interesting, you know, in terms of, yeah, because today this trial would not occur the way it did. It would not have had that circumstantial and speculative language that way. And it would, well, today we probably throw that type of trial out as mistrial because it's all circumstantial, you know, very little hard evidence. And they say sticks of no value. Yeah. to the grand jury to decide whether they would go to trial, 
Was that secret? Um, I don't know, because it was the same evidence that was provided to the, to the regular trial jury. Uh, grand jury testimony that we see today secretive. can be as secretive until it's until yeah. it's released. I mean, as we're certainly seeing now in the United States with with uh, Trump and Winston. Uh, and you know, so we're we're definitely seeing you know that the grand juries to, today still do serve a purpose because the grand juries will determine whether a trial, whether this cause for a trial. Mm -hmm. yes. Obviously, this was a seminal event in Bloomsburg. I'm just wondering, was there a newspaper of uh, any sort circulating in town at that time? And I'm just wondering about other stories. I think the main source is, is uh, James Stewart having published the transcript in 1791. Lunenburg did not have a paper at that time. Um, there was a um, paper in Halifax, but the Nova Scotia Gazette, which was the, the official government publication, I think. But in terms of a, of a, pro, of a newspaper, there wasn't anything like that down the South Shore. And in 1791, most of the people still were speaking German, and so what language would it have been? The trial obviously was conducted in English, um, but we still have the vast majority of people of, of German descent speaking German, and the Montbelliard people still spoke their dialect of French, which was probably sprinkled with some German because Montbelliard is on the Swiss German language border, French, French uh, German language border. So. <coughs>
reserve your tickets. You can speak to Rosemary tonight. She will take your money for that. If you have memberships that you want to uh, uh, ensure your seat for next year, she'll also take your money for that. In fact, if you don't want anything, she'll still take your money. <laughs> and be proud to do it. Uh, I believe with that there are no other announcements and we stand here.